So good noon after, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Hans de Goede, and uh, I work for Red Hat. I'm part of the graphics team. Uh, within the graphics team, I work on input stuff, uh, specifically lib input, but also other things related to human input devices. So today I would first like to quickly introduce lib input. Uh, and then explain why we want to start also using libinput, which was originally designed for Wayland under Xorg. And then look at what changes are required to switch our Xorg over to libinput and what that means for desktop environments and things like that. So what is libinput? Uh, libinput is a library for unified slash shared input handling for Wayland. That means that uh, under Wayland, the, there is no display server. The compositor is the display server. Right? They, they share a bunch of code through libwayland, but each desktop environment implements its own compositor and does its own display server. And when they started doing that, everyone was writing its own input code. Now, writing your own input code for keyboards and mice is fine, but anything else is pretty complicated to work with, actually. It may not look like that. But if you start looking deeper into it, then dealing with things like drawing tablets or touchpads is actually pretty complicated stuff. So uh, Peter Hudwer, who has been working on the input stack for Xorg for years already and has a lot of experience, said, no, I don't want everyone to do its own thing. <laughs> that will be horrible because then that one will be broken in that area and that one will be broken in another area and it will be a support nightmare. So he decided we needed a unified input library and he worked on that together with Jonas Adal and that's how libinput was born. Um, Peter also very much wanted to use libinput to correct some historical mistakes made in the input design in Xorg. He has tons of experience, years of experience with doing nothing than working 40 hours a week, 40 plus hours a week on the input stack in Xorg. And he said, well, I can see some places where we can do better. Um, in the beginning, we, we, as a little toy, we made something called XF86 input libinput which is a driver for X86, XF86, so for the, X, uh, for the Xorg server, to use libinput to handle input devices instead of using the old uh, EVDEV, Synaptics, and other drivers uh, to do input. That was mostly started as a way to test libinput because Wayland wasn't really usable for day-to-day -day use and we wanted to be using libinput, sort of dog fooding our own stuff. Um, Surprisingly enough, that turned out well enough that now we're actually moving Xorg over to libinput doing this. Uh, we hope for libinput that the ABI is stable with the recently released 0.8 release. We're already at 0.10 now. There were two bug fix releases, but they are ABI compatible with 0.8. So why would we want to do this, use libinput for Xorgs? Uh, well, there are not that many people in the world actually who work on human input device support under Linux, especially not once you come above the kernel level. Yeah, people have something like, well, dealing with human input is a kernel problem, and then I have a dev input evdev node, and that talks to evdev protocol problem solved. Uh, not completely true. There actually is a lot which still needs to be done in the higher layers. But there are very few people working on those. And all the people who I know of who are working on this are currently focusing on libinput. Um, so no one is maintaining the old stuff. That in itself is a good reason to switch Xorg over. But uh, since we have been able to rectify some historical mistakes in the libinput design, we can actually use that now to also make input under Xorg better because we can use libinput to do a lot of the stuff and it somehow works around some of the design issues in the old X stack. Um, one example is the old Synaptics driver. Every one of you or a lot of you have a laptop. All laptops I know of have a touchpad and touchpads under X use the Synaptics driver, which talks to the kernel, which talks to the actual touchpad. Uh, the Synaptics driver, when it was written, the state of the art was a touchpad which could track a single finger. Then, as more and more features were added to touchpads, everything was bolded on top. With a lot of chewing gum and duct tape and things like that. Especially uh, multi-touch multi -touch touchpad handling, and almost every touchpad is multi-touch nowadays, and this becomes especially important with clickpads. So a touchpad where you don't have the physical buttons, but you need to press the entire pad down to do a mouse click, um, is very ugly in Synaptics. And we're very afraid to actually touch that code. We don't want to touch it because we will fix someone's bug and introduce five new bugs. 
So, um, yeah, it's bad. A lip input touchpad code, on the other hand, was designed from day one to track multiple fingers. And if you have a touchpad which can only track one, we say, well, then we only see one finger and we use the same code. So it's, it's much nicer to work with and it's in many areas already much better than Synaptics. Another problem was that in the X world, the, the server the enumerates the input devices and then it creates an instance of a driver and that driver gets a handle to that one input device. So the Synaptics driver does not know if there was also a mouse present, if there was also a keyboard present, and if, if so, if that keyboard is being used. So we actually have something called SynDemon in the Synaptics driver, which is a process which runs under X in your session. It uses the X test extension to sn snoop on key presses, and that's the way how we have implemented disabled touchpad while typing. So it goes all, the key events go all the way up to the X server, and then we have this, this little daemon which is actually talking the X11 protocol to snoop on key presses, and then it goes all the way down to the Synaptics driver to say, eh, keys are being typed, maybe you want to disable the touchpad now. And actually, disable while typing is a stupid feature in general, because the only reason why you want disable while typing is because our palm detection is non-existent. A much better thing to do would be use palm detection. Palm detection is difficult. You want to basically do some like uh, detecting spam mails, heuristics. So with spam mails, you say, I, I see Viagra, that gets you 50 points of your likely spam. <laughs> and I see Ford's mail headers, that gets you another 50 points. Ah, you're over 100, you're spam. We want to sort of do the same with palm detection, right? Like, oh, these touches are near the, the edges of the touchpad. You're handing it. So these parts are, then probably it's a palm. And it has a certain size and a certain pressure and whatever. And if we can combine it also with information like the keyboard was recently being typed on, then we have a pretty good idea that it's a palm. Right, so we need information like that from the keyboard. And uh, in lib input, uh, there is a single context, which is the lib input context, which you can get from all the drivers. And uh, so lib input knows about all the events. It sees them as a whole, not as separate isolated instances. This is also very useful with the T440. A lot of you probably have one of the newer 40 series uh, laptops, like this one, which no longer has any buttons for the trackpad. Right? There is there is some areas here which are marked as if you click your touch your clickpad there, it's supposed to go to the track point. Um, that is nice and all, but that only works. Uh, uh, one problem with that is that. Now uh, your middle mouse button press for your track point is being generated by code which is dealing with your touchpad. So in the old x stack Synaptics would see a middle mouse button press. But your track point is being handled by the EVDEV driver, which doesn't see the middle mouse button press because it's in an isolated world. So you cannot do middle mouse button scrolling, which a lot of track point users wants to do. That's one of the other things which we have managed to fix. So, XF86 input lib input, as I already said, we created this as a testing tool. So from day one, it made it possible to use your keyboard and mouse and touchpad. Right, it just forwarded the right events and everything worked. But since it was only a testing tool, there was no way to configure it. Right, lib input has a configuration API where you can say, I want the mouse acceleration to be this, or I want this device to be in left-handed configuration, so to swap the mouse buttons or swap the touchpad buttons. Uh, we couldn't do any of that within XF86 input lib input. So we have uh, added a configuration support that has landed in a 0.4 release, which was de December 5th last year. So actually, XF86 input lib input now is completely ready to replace the old drivers. But there's always a but. Unfortunately, the configuration API for XF86 input lib input, which is a really nice name to say, uh, is uh, not the same as the one for the Synaptics and EVDEV drivers. We tried to make it compatible, but the old stuff was so crazy, it had so much configuration options, that we decided that it was better to just do a new clean API, which exactly mirrored the lib input API. Let's talk about the crazy stuff a bit. Um, if you look at the old stack, and if you look at how GNOME deals with something like saying, I'm a left-handed user, I want you to swap my mouse buttons. What happens is the actual button swapping is done at the X server level. So at the X server you say, uh, yeah, when you see a left click, treat it as a right click, and when you see a right click, treat it as a left click. <laughs> that means that you swap it for all devices which send left slash right button events, including the touchpad. 
then it's fine because a touchpad can have physical buttons or the two soft button areas at the bottom and you likely want to swap those too. But you can also tap on a touchpad. And tapping is completely handled in a synaptics driver and is it, if it sees a single finger tap, it will send a left button click, which now becomes a right button click. So single finger tap now has turned into right button clicks. Two finger taps, on the other hand, do left button clicks. Not really what we want. Luckily, the synaptics driver has over 55 different configuration options. <laughs> and a few of them are to tell you which button to send when you see a single or double finger tap. So what the GNOME configuration panel does is it swaps all button events at the X server level. And then if it sees a synaptics device, it tells the synaptics device to swap the tops. <laughs> and they get swapped back in the X server levels and they do again what you want them to do. You can imagine that this is not something which we want to try, even try to be compatible with. And the downside of that is that desktop environments need to learn the new configuration API. As I already said, the old settings are crazy, so we're not doing a drop-in replacement. We have a new clean config interface which basically mirrors libinput's native interface. We'll get back to that. That's really useful that it's almost exactly the same. And it uses X input device properties. So you have the X input extension under X, which has been around for a long time, where you can enumerate which input devices there are. And you can, for one input device, you can ask for device properties, and we just, which is basically a, a general key value store. We use that as a configuration interface in two directions. You can, there are also some read-only properties which you can use to query which modes are supported. So desktop environments will need to adjust. Um, but on some desktops or on some distributions or whatever, some users may still want one of the 50 different synaptics options and decide to disable the, 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 the uh, lib input driver and use the old drivers. So we advise if you're working on a desktop environment, and that's actually my intended audience for this target, I hope there are some desktop environment people here, <laughs> then uh, my advice is to uh, detect if which driver is being used. So if libinputxorg is being used or if evdev slash synaptics is being used. One word of, one thing extra which I want to say there, in theory it's possible for a user to use libinput for some devices because X is very configurable and the old stack for other devices. We don't care. Right? If you do that, we're going to say, sorry, you lose. We're not going to support it. Either you switch to the new stack or you stay with the old stack. We are willing to, to make that much, at least as a, as a, for a while, right? As a period in between until we move to the new situation. For the new stack, it is important to not use any of the X server level function calls. So do not tell the X server to swap buttons because that's just crazy because the X server doesn't know enough to know when to swap buttons or not, as we've seen before. Do not use that call. We have a separate, we have an explicit function which in lib input which says, I am a left-handed person. And then lib input will know what to do. Uh, so instead, only use the new device properties, including for pointer acceleration. So let's do a little demo. Not sure if, here, if there's anyone here which has also seen my talk at FOSDEM. I hope not because it was the exact same talk. Um, at FOSDEM this didn't work, but that was mostly because of um, GNOME not working with two monitors. I could get it to work at my little laptop screen, but not with an external screen. Uh, that's, that's fixed now, so thanks GNOME guys for fixing that. Um, so what I can do is I can do X input list. And then I get a list of input devices on this laptop. And I can do X input list props for 11. 11 is the touchpad, and the touchpad usually is the most interesting one. Uh, what we see here now is, can I enlarge the font? Yes, I can. Then I need to redo it, but that's okay. Something like this. So, this is more readable. Uh, so the first thing which we see is uh, behind the default things, like the device is enabled and some transformation metrics for uh, calibration, is a lib input tapping enabled. Now this, this, this one doesn't have anything special, it's just zero or one. Then we have an acceleration speed. The acceleration speed is interesting because uh, in X uh, there is actually a core API, so which is directly to the server, not to the drivers, to set acceleration speed. And it has two settings. 
Historically, X used one fixed acceleration algorithm and that had a threshold and a speed, which is really nasty to put in a UI because then you need in your UI to explain to the user what is threshold, what is speed. The user just wants the mouse to go faster. Or, hey, I find the mouse too fast, I want it to go slower. So we have uh, all that is abstracted away in lib input. You get a scale from minus 1.0 to plus 1.0. It's a float. And 0.0 means whatever lib input thinks is a decent default acceleration speed. Minus 1.0 is what lib input thinks. You really do not want to go slower than this. Plus 1.0 is you really do not want to go faster than this. Now I'll talk more about acceleration later because it's an interesting subject. Um, so uh, next thing is an Apple thing, natural scrolling enabled. Apple has something which is called natural scrolling, which is nice for touch screens, but not so nice for touch pads. It basically, it inverts the scrolling direction. So if you move down on your touch pad, the contents on your screen moves up and vice versa. Some people like it, so we have an option for it. Um, so uh, back to the Excel speed, by the way. Uh, one advantage also of, of doing this in lib input is we have it per device here. So you can, in theory, use different acceleration speeds per device. And since we're doing it per device, we can also have different acceleration algorithms. We're not using that yet. But in theory, it would be wise to have a different acceleration curve for a touchpad versus a physical mouse versus a trackball versus a whatever sort of pointing device. Right? You may want to have different acceleration curves for them. So that's all possible. The next one is actually interesting. Uh, send event modes enabled is, uh, is an array which choose one or available says one one. And to actually interpret that, we need to look into a, a lib input header. Yeah, wrong button. So here we have it. There are two flags here. We can say, uh, if you set the first flag, then it's disabled. You are effectively disabling the, the device in this case. The, the second one is interesting. This is something which, again, we can do because we have an overview of all the devices which are available on the system. You can, uh, on your touchpad, you can set, well, I like the touchpad, but if I have an external mouse, I like the external mouse better. And I like it so much better that I will never use the touchpad and I don't want to see accidental brushes moving my mouse pointer. So you can set uh, send events mode uh, disabled on external mouse. And we can see here in the, the X input list props that uh, for available it says I can do both. I can be completely disabled. I would expect any device to be able to completely disabled. But also I can be disabled whenever an external mouse is plugged in. So you could export that in your UI, or a user could do this from the command line, and it could say, disable the touchpad whenever an external mouse gets plugged in. We even have a little hack in there that if you have a T440 series, or an X240 or T4540, and you have the top buttons for the track points, those keep working. We really consider the top buttons on the 40 series of Lenovo as part of the track point, so we keep them sending button events, even if you disable the rest of the touchpad which is a nifty hack. And then we have some more options which I'm not going to all go through because that's boring. Pointer acceleration. I already promised you I would say a little bit more about this. Uh, we have this nice concept in lib input where we say that uh, pointer acceleration uh, is per device, but also that 0.0, .0 is a good default setting. We can only make it true that 0.0, .0 is a good default setting if we actually know something about the hardware, right? Because uh, with, if you have a mouse, a mouse generates something which used to be called Mickey's. I believe it comes from Mickey Mouse. <laughs> and uh, the meaning is we have no clue what the unit of this is. Right? It generates pulses when the little physical ball rolls, and it generates x pulses per rotation of the axis which is connected to the ball, and we don't know the diameter of the ball, and we don't know how much pulses per rotation of the axis which is connected to the ball, and we have no clue. <laughs> and nowadays we have no ball, but we still have no clue. Nowadays we get, we get something which is called CPI. We get clicks per inch. Uh, it's called clicks. Don't know why. It's, yeah, the thing has a resolution. Uh, 
old optical mice do 300 or 400 dpi. We could fix that by saying, oh, 350. Everything is 350. But newer optical mouse, the cheapest one you can buy now in China for like $3, including shipping, do already 1,000 CPI. And if you buy a proper Logitech one, you get 2,000 or 4,000 CPI, and then you have crazy gaming mouse. So the spectrum is almost a fuck fa factor 10. Right? The old ones, which are still used a lot because they don't break, they have a USB plug, they work fine, uh, are doing 300 CPI, and the new ones are doing over 4,000 CPI. Factor 10. That's a problem. We cannot have a reasonable default without knowing what. So we have uh, introduced, we are working on, it's already upstream, but it's not complete yet, it will probably never be complete, a UDEV hardware database, where UDEV will add a tag to mice, saying this mice has this resolution. So based on USB ID or whatever. Unfortunately, uh, the USB hit standard in some ways is really stupid. One of them is that they didn't put this in the standard to begin with, that we couldn't not just not get it from the hardware. Another thing is that you have something called gaming mice. Yes? I'm wondering how do other platforms, such as the Windows NT, deal with this? Do they ship like uh, in files with the hardware? I have no clue. Yeah, if you install the vendor driver, that knows, probably. Because another problem is if you have a gaming mice, or some Chinese mice have it too, the cheap ones, they have a button to change the CPI which they report. What we, we will put all the CPI which a mice reports in the UDEV database, because we're asking a user when he is adding a new uh, device, like just tell us all the resolutions which it can support, and also tell us what the factory default is, so what it comes up with when you plug it in. And that's what we use. We use the factory default because, yeah, this is a, this is a, a, a lose-lose proposition. We cannot get it right when the, 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 the CPI is not configurable. But at least with the UDEV database, we should be able to get it right for a high-end Logitech mouse. Most of those have a fixed CPI and a cheap one and a modern cheap one. We should all, for all of them, be able to get you a, recent, a decent mouse acceleration. This also has the advantage that um, even if you have only one slider in your desktop environment, uh, and if you have a docking station at home and a docking station at your desk, uh, at, at the office, and there are different mice plugged in, that both of them will still sort of get the same feeling. Right? You can imagine that if you have the, the expensive Logitech ma mouse at home, and your boss is a cheap ass, and he's using an old Dell laptop from, uh, mice from two generations ago, <laughs> that, uh, and you, you have two docking stations, that you need to track the speed slider all the time, right? Because one is horribly too fast, and the other is horribly too slow, and... We, this should fix this, all this. So this is really nice, but we need people to, to submit uh, hardware database entries for their mice. So how does this... But you know that you mm -hmm. have a problem with huge amount of most of those Chinese mice because of the way how they reuse USB IDs. Yes, well, we hope... Um, we, we, yeah, that might be a problem. I cannot say it won't be. We hope that at least the, the 300 CPI uh, generation versus the 1000 CPI generation, because that are basically the two options you have with a Chinese mouse, will have different IDs. If all the 1000 CPIs want reuse IDs, that's fine. As long as they don't use an ID which was used for a 300 CPI one or vice versa. And yeah, only, uh, we can only figure out what to do when we actually hit a real problem. If we need to ask this to the user, we lose. And the user may have multiple mice, the docking station story, yada, yada. Where you different devices, of course, and not the workload. Configurable. Yeah. Why not? It is configurable. Yeah. 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 It is. You can write a UDEV rule which does this. And if someone wants to, writes to, wants to write a UI to generate those UDEV rules, more power to them. Our proposition as, as input developers is this should just work. Right, we should get one user with that mice to submit a rule which goes into the upstream UDEV hardware database, and then from then on, all the users of that mice should have it just working. And we're trying to get as far in that direction as we can go. But it's always possible, it's a UDEV property, so you can always write a UDEV rule if I see this mice, and you could write a, write a tool which generates those UDEV rules if you want to. More power to you, but it's not something which we plan to do, basically. 
So desktop environments. Uh, GNOME has already been working. KDE also, by the way. I think KDE is, has merged it upstream or is close to merging it upstream. Yeah. GNOME has also merged this upstream. So kudos to both the KDE and GNOME guys. Great work. This is already starting to land upstream. Um, the, the way the GNOME guys solved it is interesting because uh, they said, well, in the future, the compositor, Wayland is the future, in the future the compositor will be doing all the input handling, so it should be the ones which at least applies the configuration settings. It doesn't generate them, right? That's some config panel, but it should apply them. So they put support in Mother for applying configuration settings. Mother is the library which GNOME Shell uses, which contains most of the compositor functionality. And uh, Mother now reads lib input settings from a GNOME-specific uh, backend, which also has events when they change. And uh, then it has, an have a, has a backend abstraction for applying them. So the, 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 the code in Mother which reads the settings and the format of the settings is the same for X11 and Wayland. So this is where it's interesting, where I think it's a good way to do things. And then when it applies them, it has an, an abstract backend interface and two implementations. It has an X11 implementation, which does the property thingies. And it has a Wayland implementation, which just calls directly into libinput. Because all the properties are a one-on-one -on -one mirror of libinput. So it can just directly call the libinput function, because Wayland, the compositor, is actually the one which is talking directly to libinput, which is talking directly to the input devices. Uh, this is all nice from the, the applying side, right? So the compositors can apply the input settings and should be the one who applies the input settings. But the control center needs to know which options are available. I already said something like disable when an external mouse is plugged in. Only makes sense for the trackpad. It doesn't make sense for a mouse, for example. Um, so it needs to know which settings are available to know which checkboxes to show and whatever. Now, uh, the plan there is to uh, use lib input proper uh, or UDEF properties. We already set a lot of uh, UDEF properties on input devices anyways, which are already used by X auto configuration, etc., to determine which driver it needs to load. Uh, so we'll add some more prefix with lib input underscore, which will basically say this device has this configuration options available. And then the touch the control center can read those properties and see I can now show these checkboxes or not. I can show trackpad specific options or not, etc. Uh, the lib input UDEF helper currently is floating around on the mailing list as a patch somewhere. It may be also in one of Carlos's personal Git repositories somewhere. Um, but it's uh, mostly, uh, but the plan is to make it part of lib input proper, right? So that all KDE can use it too, all the upstream desktop environments can use the same input properties for this. So what does the future bring? Um, XF86 input, lib input will be the default input driver for Fedora 22 for the workstation product. We wanted to make it the default for everything. We wanted to just put the requires in the X server, require this driver, so it will always get installed. And the X server uses configuration templates, which has like number-name.conf, and we put a high priority one in, so number 99 or something, which got parsed last, so it wins. And it would, that would be the lib input one, and it would just use lib input for everything except for Wacom tablets, because those are special, and we don't support them yet. But, and they have their own X driver, which is really complicated. So probably for X, we'll never start using lib input for the drawing tablets. But for everything else, we want to use lib input. Uh, we backed out of that. The plan now is to, to only enable it in the workstation product. As I said before, the idea is that uh, by making it part of the default workstation install, most users will still get it. But we want spins, for example, the LXDE spin or the XFCE spin or whatever, to be able to, to not install it because their configuration panel applets will likely not be updated. And then probably for 23, we will make it really, really the default. And hopefully, LXDE and XFCE will be fixed by then. Um, I actually got, got these numbers wrong. I realized later. I haven't fixed them yet. Uh, the upcoming Xorg, or the just released Xorg server 1.17, I thought it would be 1.18 because I didn't know Xorg did uh, odd release numbers. <laughs> uh, some projects only do even release numbers, like GNOME. <laughs> uh, but X apparently also does odd. So the upcoming 1.7, or the just released 1.17 release, actually has the mode setting video driver built in. The idea is that if you do a manual X install or whatever, we want at least to be able to light up the monitor. So we, if you have a KMS driver, 
and the mode setting driver you will get unaccelerated video, but at least even if you don't have a, the, the Intel driver or the ATI driver or whatever, you will get something on your screen. The problem is, if you do that, if you manually build X and you install it now, you'll get something on your screen, but you won't be able to move the mouse cursor or type anything. So the plan for the upcoming 1.18 release is to uh, also integrate lib input into the server, so that if you just do a git pool and you build it manually and you install it, you will get everything working except for special things like Wacom tablets on the input side. And on the output side, you will have everything working, but you won't have acceleration. At least no 2D acceleration. Uh, so our advice, our in this case is people who are working a lot on, on, on the input stack in uh, Linux, is to all desktop environments and all distributions, get ready to move to uh, XF86 input lib input as default and start saying goodbye to the old drivers. The old drivers will stick around, the BSD guys will maintain them for the next 10 years <laughs> or something. Probably at least keep them building, but um, yeah, we want to move away from them because lib input is just better in a number of ways and it will only get better. So, so that completes my presentations. Are there any questions? Yes. What about Anaconda? <laughs> the question is, what about Anaconda? You need to make sure that in your, 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 your image, your installation image, so the, the, the one which has the Anaconda root file system environment, you have this driver and you have the, the, the xorg.conf rule, basically just draw, draw in this RPM and do not strip anything from it because I know that you guys do dirty stuff when you generate a root file system image that you remove files, even though, though they were installed by RPM. <laughs> uh, don't remove anything, any files from here. There are only two and you need both of them. <laughs> And uh, then it should just work. And you can drop then, then you can drop both the EVDEV driver and the Synaptics driver. So you may even gain some space while you get the lib input as dependency. And if we want to, I don't know, enable something like root option, like I am Uh Yeah, that's possible. Then you would need to set the export properties yourself. We, you don't do that yet, right? Is there any API for this? Uh, yeah, the X input properties. Under X, if you're under Wayland, you can just directly call into libinput. If you're the compositor, I guess under Wayland, Anaconda will be its own compositor. Don't know. How far are you guys with Wayland support? Nowhere. <laughs> Nowhere. Okay. But do do you currently have an I am left-handed option? No, we don't. If you want to add it, yeah, then you would just need to talk to X input, enumerate over all the devices, and just set a property on all the devices. The question is, this lib input, does it also handle keyboards? Yes and no. It will give you raw key codes. It will basically give you the EVDEV button codes. Well, all of them, including those that are not uh, currently, handled by, currently handled by the, the current driver? Yes, it will give you all of them, yes. Nice. Well, not under X, of course, because if you, if you just use raw lib input, so you're a Wayland compositor, then yes. But if you're running the X wrapper, then yeah, where we're injecting it into X and there it ends because X only knows about eight bits. <laughs> uh, the rest, keyboards are easy and complicated. At this level, keyboards are easy. You get a button, it generates a scan code. You say scan code expressed or scan code X released. They're difficult translating the scan code to a symbol. We, under X, we have something called XKB. This is a horrible complex monster. Uh, Peter, who actually knows the code a bit, says, well, you don't want to look into fixing stuff up there because you will go crazy and I don't want you to go crazy, <laughs> basically. Um, but uh, for Wayland, we just said, well, this is a solved problem. We'll just reuse XKB. So XKB is also being used in Wayland. But the difference is that the new libxkb, all the, co the code has been uh, extracted into a libxkb common, actually uses 32-bit scan codes. So it can handle translation to sims for hierarchies. But the problem is that we now have this loop where you get evdev node, lib input, xf86 input, uh, lib input xorg, talks to the x server, uh-oh, we lose all the higher bits. <laughs> And then the client uses libxkb common through libx11. And then, yeah, so we lose the bits somewhere under X. But under Wayland, we, we, we cut out the X bit where we lose the higher bits and there everything should work. 
So are there more questions? Do we, yeah, do we plan to support graphical tablets, so Wacom, uh, Wacom drawing tablets or other vendor drawing tablets? Uh, under uh, Yes, we do. We have uh, a good question. We have branches ready in lib input. It's mostly finished, but it's sitting on a branch for now. It's sitting on a branch because we're waiting for the Wayland protocol, which is mostly finished by now. Uh, the Wayland protocol is sitting on a branch because we, don't, we want to know we get it right, because once we publish it, it needs to be, it's fixed, right? It's ABI. Uh, so it's sitting on a branch because we're waiting for the first implementation, which is GTK. GTK is going to use uh, 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 the Wayland protocol to do drawing tablets under Wayland. Uh, we're sort of waiting for GTK, but I think that code is also mostly finished and sitting on a branch because we're waiting for the GIMP to use it. And once we have it working in the GIMP, no, not true. Oh, that won't happen soon. So how are we going, but we need that last step to be able to validate we got everything right and then we can push all the branches. <laughs> there are already other applications on GTK which, which we can test with. Okay. Yeah, we can test that, yeah. So the question was, can't you just use the, the Wacom tablet as a normal device? Yeah, sure, we can test that you can move the mouse cursor around with it. The problem is to know that we got the API right, we need to have a serious application user which uses things like tilt and the pressure sensitivity and whatever, right? Because if we get any of that wrong, we'll be in a herd of pain later when we need to fix it in an API compatible manner. But this is being worked on, it's sitting on a ton of branches and when we feel that it's ready, we can start pushing out all those branches pretty quickly. So it's almost there, but we're just not 100% comfortable with it. I think it's the best way to put it. Do you have anything, uh, any non Wacom graphical tablets to test against? Do we have any non Wacom ta graphical tablets to test against? I don't know. I don't know what my colleagues have. I don't. What? And Entric? Uh, yeah. Okay, so I heard from my colleague that we have something called Entric, and we have a couple of those at Red Hat, or Benjamin has some, or. No, but do we have some of those tablets available between you, me, Peter, Benjamin? I don't think so. Yeah. Okay. So we know there's something, a vendor called Entric, and we don't have any of them. <laughs> it would probably be good to get some. <laughs> uh, would you like to have some, uh, like, captures? Some captures would be useful-ish. Actual hardware would be better. But, <laughs> but if you want to submit some captures to say Peter or me or whatever, I'll share them with Peter and vice versa, yes, yes please. It's at, least, at least it's a start. I still have two minutes, so I guess I can take one or two more questions, yes. The question is what about QT? I can be really quick about that, I have no clue. Okay, so to summarize, uh, yes, QT4 has an API, but the only serious user, which is Krita, doesn't use it because it's not powerful enough. It talks directly to the hardware. Okay, one last question. Yes. I'm not sure I understand. We plan to make a MICE hardware database, which will have resolution info for MICE. And your question is, 
ca can we add other info there? Yes, it's just you, we're not creating a new database. It's UDEF's hardware database. And we just talked to the upstream UDEF guys, like, can we put this in? And we made a format. And so, yeah, sure, if you want to put more stuff in UDEF hardware database and you think it's useful and you can get upstream to acknowledge that it's useful and support it, then yeah, sure. I'm getting out of time flash, that's me. So thank you for your time. Yeah, right. I mean, like, technically, it should be.